Hi, I'm Paul Kimball, and in this episode of The Other Side of Truth, I travel back in time to the year 2001 in an interview I conducted with the late Carl Flock. I first met Carl Flock in 2001 when I interviewed him for the documentary Stanton T. Friedman is Real. Over the next five years of his life, before he passed away in 2006 from ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease as it's more commonly known, Carl and I became good friends. I met him a couple of other times, interviewed him for other films, and we kept up a regular correspondence not only about the UFO phenomenon, but about politics and literature and a bunch of other subjects that interested both of us and on which we found much common ground, and also many things about which we agreed to disagree. Of all the UFO researchers that I've gotten to know over the past 11 years of filmmaking and interacting with them, Carl is the one for whom I have the most respect. He was a skeptical thinker in the truest sense of the word. He stood in the middle. He was convinced that extraterrestrials had visited Earth. He was equally convinced that Roswell was not evidence of that extraterrestrial visitation. That's a hard road to follow because on one side you're going to have the true believers who hold Roswell up as the holy grail of extraterrestrial visitation and on the other side you're going to have the disbelievers as I call them. The people who think there is nothing to the UFO phenomenon and won't even admit to the possibility that the extraterrestrial hypothesis might in fact be true. Carl managed to annoy people in both camps and I think that's probably why I liked him because he didn't care what other people thought about him or what he said. He stayed true to himself, true to his views, and true to where he thought the evidence led him. And I don't think anybody could ask for anything more. UFO research is poorer without him. Ladies and gentlemen, Carl Flock on the other side of truth. I start off all interviews, Carl, with one basic question. Who are you? So this is your opportunity. Tell us a bit about how you became involved in UFO research and also a bit about your own personal background, where you worked, who you are. I am a writer and ufologist. I suppose I should say author. I guess that would be more interesting. But anyway, uh, I have been actively involved in and interested in UFOs literally since I was a child. I've done other things in my life. I uh, was a uh, senior congressional staffer for a number of years with Jack Kemp and, and another congressman named Ken Kramer. And in fact, I, when I worked for Ken, I was the guy that organized the first actual hearings on Star Wars, uh, much to the chagrin of the Reagan administration, but that's another story. We were supportive, but they didn't want to come up there that soon. And uh, you know, I was an intelligence officer with the CIA before that, back in the 60s. I went from Capitol Hill to the Reagan administration as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Test and Evaluation, where I had a title that even goes longer than that. And uh, you know, since, um, since 1992, uh, I have been a full-time freelance writer, working on all sorts of things, not just ufology, but unfortunately a large chunk of my life over these, many, these past nine years has been Roswell. One thing I would like to get on the record, and I would hope you would try to include, is, is that because I am continually being blaggarded as a debunker, I'd like to make really clear actually where I stand on the subject of UFOs. Sure, that's as good a place as any to start. So perhaps you can talk a bit about believers versus disbelievers, and what it's like to try and walk the middle line between the two. Yeah, one of the things that, that I think about me that confounds people on both sides of the, if you will, the UFO belief divide is that I am firmly convinced that UFOs are real, but I am a principal critic, if you will, of uh, the holy grail of modern ufology, which is Roswell. My views on UFOs are uh, fairly straightforward. 
I believe that UFOs are real. That is that they are, they are unidentified flying objects. And that some proportion of, of UFO sightings, that is those sightings which remain after very careful investigation still unknown, are examples of uh, observations of craft and in some instances beings from another planet. I have a, I have a 50s conditioned mind, if you will, and so I see them as, as far more likely to be visitors from an extrasolar planet than, say, from an alternate universe or some of the other favorite ideas of the current age. And so, yes, I am a UFO believer and a believer that we have, in fact, been visited, but my belief, if you want to call it that, is based on the body of data that we have in hand. And I think that it's an obligation of anyone who takes the subject seriously to think critically about the data and to pursue the facts uh, wherever they might go. That's what I've done, for example, with Roswell, uh, much to my own disappointment and uh, much to the upset of a lot of uh, my colleagues and others interested in the subject. All right, Roswell, tell me about your book, your research, your involvement in that case, and what it's been like to try and find answers. Uh, Roswell, of course, has become a case which everyone considers to be the defining case, if you will, of, uh, of contemporary ufology. And, and, of course, because of the fact that it offers the opportunity or the prospect of actual physical evidence and proof of visitation, uh, everyone is very excited about it and, and, and has been for many years. And so was I. That's how I got into it. When I first took a look at the case, when I first read Kevin Randall's uh, and, and Don Schmidt's book, a UFO Crash at Roswell, having earlier read the Roswell incident, which didn't impress me terribly much, I thought, gee, there's been some very serious work done here that, that, that suggests that there's something more to this incident than uh, a weather balloon. Uh, and so I got involved. And I had hoped that, in fact, my work would, uh, would supplement, reinforce, help further prove the case that was being made by other researchers. I discovered, uh, unfortunately, that it was quite the opposite. What I discovered was that there was a lot less to Roswell than meets the eye, that most of the case that makes Roswell incident, uh, the incident interesting is uh, not a case at all. It, it's a combination of hype and wishful thinking and a fraudulent uh, uh, testimony and expectations being, uh, if you will, self-fulfilled. So what I discovered was that Roswell indeed was a real incident. Something very real happened. Something real was recovered. There was really a cover-up. But what was being covered up was not uh, a, the uh, crash and recovery of a, an alien spacecraft and the bodies of its crew, but rather a highly sensitive, highly classified project uh, of the United States government. And I spent a, a good eight years digging into this case in, in, in excruciating detail. And uh, I have uh, uh, laid out in my book, Roswell, Inconvenient Facts uh, and the Will to Believe, this whole odyssey, if you will, as well as the, all the data and evidence that back up my conclusions. These are the conclusions to which I came very reluctantly, because I wanted as much as anyone else to be able to say, wow, you know, here we have a crash flying saucer, here's the proof, and now you know, there's no longer any doubt that uh, all the things that those of us who have been crazy enough to take this seriously for so many years really, really is true. But alas, not the case. From there, Perhaps you could go into a bit about the sociology of ufology of the Roswell case, and in particular, why you chose the term the will to believe as the subtitle for your book on Roswell. It, it was not by any accident that the will to believe is part of the subtitle of my book. What I mean by it is the, the desire for something to be true affecting one's judgment and assessment of the facts before you. The poster on the wall in Fox Mulder's office that says, I want to believe, is, uh, is a, uh, a representation of what happens to be the very real thing in ufology. People want very much for these, for, to believe whatever it is that happens to be their, uh, their interest, aliens' visitation, uh, uh, abductions, etc. Unfortunately, what happens is, is that this leads them to ignore facts that are inconvenient, that is, facts which are contrary to the things that they want to believe, 
Roswell is, is replete with this, as are uh, so many other things in ufology. Uh, abductions is another example of this, I think. So we have a real problem, especially since the field is not one which is self-policing in any kind of formal or semi-formal way like other disciplines are. It's much more, it's a, it's a, it's a field more dominated by enthusiasm and fannishness, if you will, rather than, than, than serious scientific or serious academic pursuit like you, you find in other fields where you have peer review and so on, where there's a formalized process. I'm not saying that there aren't people who are serious investigators, that there aren't people who do really good work in ufology, because there are. But this is embedded in this greater, you know, larger matrix of, of belief and, and sort of pop culture that really causes a, a serious problem. And the problem is not only the will to believe, it's the will to, un to not believe. You have, you have the mirror image on the, on the so-called skeptic side. The so-called the Psychopians, the uh, Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, Whew, mouthful. They start from the premise, they can't be, therefore they aren't. The true believers start from the, they must be, therefore they are. Well, those of us who are, are pursuing the facts where they lead, uh, with the idea of pulling out the truth from those facts and, and really finding out what the answers are, are caught between uh, the true believers and the, tr and the true unbelievers. And we're defined by them, unfortunately, all too often. So it's very hard to get people who are outside the field who actually have professional expertise and knowledge that could be brought to bear in a very effective and constructive way to get involved because they don't want to be caught in that, that bizarre definition problem either. Coupled with the problem of true believer versus true unbeliever, you have within those camps and across the camps and all the way around all the various factions within ufology, you have a continuing problem of clashing egos and a continual concern to try to build oneself up at the expense of others and the kind of thing that you always, that really, quite frankly, that you always find in areas of interest and, and, and study where there isn't any kind of formalized discipline. You have people defining things themselves based on their own particular interests. They have their own desires to be the big frog in the small pond. Uh, you get that kind of infighting that goes on without any sort of real venue for refereeing at all. And I think this, this really, what happens is, is that that becomes the focus of interest, this kind of um, infighting that goes on, becomes the focus of interest at the expense of the phenomenon, the study of the phenomenon. It's a, it's a continuing problem. Sometimes it's incredibly amusing. And most often it's terribly frustrating for those of us who are trying to move forward with some kind of serious investigation of the, of the, the, uh, the UFO phenomenon. The question of, this, of infighting and, and character assassination and all of the things that go on in the field is something that I have uh, experienced personally uh, more you know, times than I care to remember. And most recently now with the publication of my book, I have come under severe attack from some quarters, although I have to say generally the reception has been very positive, even from people who j disagree with the conclusions that I've arrived at. They have to say, hey, look, you know, this is, this is an important contribution because it tells us a lot of things we didn't know. It puts things in context in a way that we didn't know. But in general, uh, you know, I'm, I have been blackguarded by a, a lot of folks as, uh, well, interestingly, here's the interesting thing. I think that particularly it makes me more a bad guy, if you will, than, uh, say, a Phil Class, who has you know, always been defined as an infidel anyway. I'm looked at as, as something of a heretic, because I am a, quote, believer, unquote, who dares to stand up and say that, you know, the Holy Grail is not made of gold, that Roswell is, uh, is just pot metal, and maybe barely that. And so I've been really, you know, I have really been attacked for having the, uh, you know, the gall to do that. Notably, and this just amazed me, uh, we have uh, the International UFO Reporter, which is the magazine of the Center for UFO Studies. The current issue, 32-page magazine, there's a 12-page, quote, review, unquote, by Robert Durant uh, attacking my book and me. And I have no problem with people going after me on, on matters of substance or raising questions about my interpretation of facts or, or representation of the facts. That's a collegial exchange of ideas and, and collegial 
constructive conflict, if you want to call it that. But when you get into ad hominem attacks, like I uh, was hit with in that particular review, and the kind of stuff that goes on in less formal venues, like on online, on, uh, on things like UFO updates, well, it's just a big disappointment, I guess. What about the relationship between you and Stan? Is there a rivalry there? Because he's the biggest proponent of the extraterrestrial explanation, and you have become, I guess, the biggest proponent of the Project Mogul explanation. Perhaps you could talk a bit about the relationship between you two as it relates to any competitiveness that, that might take place. Is there ego involved here as well as just a, an objective search for the truth? I don't, I don't want to make too much of the squabbling in ufology. I mean, it's important. I think it's an important question, because, especially because, after all, ufology is a kind of fringe or proto-science or parascience. So, therefore, it, it, it probably this kind of thing is more harmful because you, you're not an established discipline. Okay, but the the truth is, if you take a look at if you take a look at the history of science, if you take a look at the history of any kind of established discipline uh, in the in the hard sciences or the or the soft sciences, so called. You've got the same kind of clashes of personality and the attempts to undercut each other and all of the stuff that goes on in ufology. But it happens in the context, again, of an established discipline. And so it's moderated. Ufology is, is, is continually self-defining and now with the internet it gets even crazier. Stan Friedman and I have known each other, uh, let's see, we first met actually just a little over a year, or a little over nine years ago. Uh, in Washington when he and Don Berliner were there to promote their book, UFO Crash at Corona. Or I may not have the title exactly correct, but it's Crash at Corona, I believe is the title. And that's where we first met. And we, we have actually, we, while we have clashed on issues, and while we have had, we have serious disagreements about Roswell, we have almost invariably been collegial about it and you know so I like Stan very much as a person and uh, we, he seems to like me we get along well and so our disputes have have been much more of the sort of disputation that you would like to see in a in a real discipline pursuing the truth we have also cooperated with each other on Roswell specifically and and on some other things as well but we have actually pursued some elements of the Roswell story together where we have dug out facts that have shown that, that certain witnesses, like uh, Frankie Rowe, for example, were not credible. Uh, and so, you know, we, we have been able to work together on things where we uh, can cooperate, and we have been able to disagree relatively cordially on most issues. There have been very few places where we've gotten into the real knockdown dragout drag-out that has happened between Stan and other people in the field. Let's move off the sociology of ufology for a while and talk about one of the key aspects of the Roswell case, I suppose probably the key aspect given the nature of the evidence, which is witness testimony. You write a great deal in your book about the various witnesses in the Roswell case and some of the problems with them. Let's start with Glenn Dennis. Roswell um, is, is replete with people who at first blush seem to have very interesting information and seem to have been very much involved in an important way. And then when you start digging into it, you discover things uh, that demonstrate quite a different picture. One of these is Glenn Dennis. Glenn Dennis was, a, 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 at the time of the incident, a, a newly minted embalmer working at the Ballard Funeral Home in, in, in Roswell. And he claims to have been told by a nurse, an army nurse that worked at the Roswell Army Airfield, uh, that she was involved in the preliminary examination of some terribly mutilated alien bodies. His story there is nothing to back it up. It's, it, it's strictly his own personal story with no supporting witnesses. So you have to go on his credibility to start with. But one of the things that he claimed was is that shortly after the nurses uh, having told him about this incident and giving him sketches of the aliens that were supposedly involved, she supposedly was precipitously transferred from the base and disappeared. And then he later learned, he said, uh, that she had died in a plane crash in England. Well. He gave me the nurse's name, he said, uh, Naomi Maria Self with two Fs. And uh, this was the first time we had met. And I asked him, well, why, you know, did you give me this information? Because you've not, you know, this is different than what you've told other people. He said, well, you know, I'm not sure that these other guys really know what they're doing and, and you got your connections and maybe you can dig this out. 
To make a long story short, a lot of us made major efforts to locate this nurse or some record of her. And not only uh, were we unable to locate her, we were able on you know, others, uh, Victor Golubic among others, and uh, myself and Kevin Randall, were able to locate the records of all of the medical personnel who had been assigned to Roswell Army Airfield during the period in question. In fact, years starting in 1946 and all the way through the end of 1948, there was no Naomi, Naomi Maria Self or anyone with a similar name and so on. And when confronted with this, Dennis said, oh, well, you know, that wasn't her name anyway. I didn't trust any of you guys, and I'm just never going to reveal what her name really is and so on. Most interesting, though, about Glenn, and this, and, and, and this, this brings Stan Friedman into the picture big time. In August of 1989, when Stan was in Roswell working on the Unsolved Mysteries segment about the Roswell case, he learned of Glenn Dennis and he was taken out to Lincoln by Robert Shirky, another one of the witnesses, to interview him. And in the course of the interview, Glenn says something about, well, I saw some place where the little bodies were found a couple of miles away from where the crash site was. And Stan says, well, was that from the information that I sent to you? or was that somewhere else? He says, well, I saw it being talked about on TV last night uh, where they had the pictures and Stan says, oh, well, this, and he shows him a slide of the sketches of the aliens and Glenn says, oh, yeah, that, that, that's it. Well, the sketches of the aliens in question appeared in the Roswell Daily Record on the front page in June of 1987 along with an article in which Stan is quoted, Stan Friedman is quoted as saying, I have seen government documents that showed that the bodies were found at a site two and a half to three miles away from the debris field. Well, these were the MJ-12 documents, the infamous MJ-12 documents. Well, Glenn, apparently, the day that that appeared, said something to someone else about having seen those sketches in the paper and said, that, well, that's what they really look like, by golly. Okay, so Glenn gets the idea from something that Stan had said two years before, feeds it back to Stan in 1989, it becomes then part of the Roswell lore, and it's never even noticed. I mean, I myself, until I went back and was going through this material to work to complete this book, my new book, I hadn't picked up on that either. But what we had here was a clear case of the witness feeding back to the ufologist the ufologist's own words without the ufologist even knowing it. So the, the case is full of this kind of thing. Uh, Frank Kaufman did the same thing. Frank Kaufman is the other fellow who was everywhere. You know, Frank Kaufman was the guy who watched the spacecraft on the radar. Frank Kaufman was the guy that went out to the crash site. Frank Kaufman this, Frank Kaufman that. Kaufman has been the cornerstone of both the original story about the debris field on the Brazel, Brazel Ranch and then the crash site two or three miles away with the bodies, and then later the story being moved over to the site north of Roswell. You know, he's the guy that originally it was a disc-shaped craft, and now it's a heel-shaped craft, and so on. But he keyed on lots of things that he was picking up in the same way that Glenn Dennis did. So you have this incredible contamination of the witness testimony, in no small part contributed to by the UFO investigators themselves. Dan being a, an unfortunate, uh, you know, a, a significant culprit, at least with reference to Glenn Dennis and, and Frank Kaufman. You hear continually that there were hundreds of witnesses. Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt in their book have, uh, you know, something on the order of 287 people listed as witnesses or people who were interviewed in connection with the case. And in fact, when you start boiling down the witnesses to the ones that really matter, and I use witnesses with quotes around it, quite frankly, because many of the people listed as witnesses were just people who you got directions from, I mean, literally so, the kid at the gas station who told you how to make the right turn to get down to the, uh, you know, to Corona or whatever. When you boil this down, you've got only 41 people who legitimately can be considered to be first or second hand witnesses to something relevant to the case at the time. Right? When you still boil the thing down still further to try to figure out who actually had credibly could be considered to have actually seen something of the physical material that was recovered, you get down to 23. When you take it down still further to those who you know saw the stuff and are claiming odd properties associated with it that suggest otherworldly origins, the number is down to seven. 
And actually, you can really say six, because one of those was Colonel Blanchard, who was the commander of the base, who authorized the release of the press announcement that brought the whole case to the world's attention. In his case, you can't really say he thought there were odd properties. He just thought he had a flying saucer. So you've got a half a dozen people, two Marcells, Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer, and his son, Dr. Jesse Marcel, who was 11 at the time, and Loretta Proctor and her husband and a couple of others. And if you look at everything that they have to say, their comments about odd properties are embedded in a much larger body of testimony that points directly to an earthly mundane source, which was this classified project, uh, codenamed Mogul, uh, that was going on about 100 miles away. So you don't really have hundreds of witnesses at all. You've got this tiny handful of people. When you, when you get to the more exotic part of the story, which is the bodies, there are only four people who have been interviewed by investigators and who, who have been identified publicly who claim to have had direct first-hand experience with the bodies. One of them uh, is Frank Kaufman, the late Frank Kaufman, who is not credible. There's a tremendous amount of information available on him, and, and my book's got an entire chapter devoted to him that points that out. There's Jim Ragsdale, who told tall tales and nobody seems to agree. Everyone seems to agree, regardless of where they are on this case, that he's not credible. Uh, you have Gerald Anderson, who, uh, once again, is a highly non-credible witness. And um, the fourth one, if I could think of the name. Uh, but the point is, is that you've got, you have, you have, oh, uh, Albert Lovejoy Duran is the fourth person. So you have Ragsdale, Kaufman, Gerald Anderson, and Albert Lovejoy Duran, who was allegedly an army officer, now retired, who only appears as a throwaway in a, th in a footnote in Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt's second book, uh, The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell. He just appears and goes away. So here you, what have you got? You've got four not credible witnesses. Uh, you have another person who was anonymous, whom I, in my book, call New Mexico Jones, who called Kevin Randall anonymously and claims to have been on the site and seen the bodies and, and been chased off by the army and so on, to the most exotic part of the whole story. You have a whole slew of people who claim second and third hand knowledge to this exotic stuff, and that's it, and most of them are not credible. You have a half a dozen people who actually, you can say for sure, really did see the physical stuff and handled it, uh, who claim a certain amount of you know, peculiarity about the stuff, but it's in the context of a discussion or of a testimony that talks about all of the things that match up to Project Mogul. So that's the case. That's Roswell. And yet here we have this wonderful Roswellian myth. You know, and then if you take it a step further and say, okay, what did the government really know? What about this big cover-up that has been alleged? Where is there evidence that will support the claim that the government had recovered a crash flying saucer in July of 1947 or any other time? And when you go into the formerly classified record, which is now quite substantial, and this is the formerly classified record of communications uh, between and amongst the people whose job it was to crack the flying saucer mystery back in those days. The very senior level military people, very senior level scientists, and so on. What you discover is not only is Roswell never mentioned, not even in passing, you discover that physical evidence is discussed at great length in many cases, always in terms of lamenting the fact that they didn't have any. And uh, one of the, uh, to me, one of the, the thing that, one instance that sums up all of this, and there's much more where you can read it. In fact, I reproduce the, many of the documents in my book, in an appendix, I reproduce these, uh, these communications. The one thing that kind of sums up all of this frustration on the part of the people who wanted to get to the bottom of the flying saucer mystery, and the military took it extremely seriously in those days. They were very concerned. They thought it was a, you know, we were dealing with a, a real possible threat situation. Was the, uh, uh, the presentation that Colonel uh, Howard M. McCoy gave before the first substantive meeting of the United States Air Force Scientific Advisory Board in March of 1948. The Air Force Scientific Advisory Board is a group of scientists and other experts that advise the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force on technical and scientific matters bearing on the mission of the service. At this time, it was chaired by Theodore von Karman, a very famous rocket scientist. Many other extremely prominent people served on this. Colonel McCoy was the head of intelligence 
for the Air Materiel Command at Wright Field. And in his organization was the Air Force Flying Saucer Investigation Group, at that time codenamed Project Sign. March of 1948, he's making a presentation, a summary presentation of the activities of his organization, briefing up, if you will, the board on all of the things that they're doing and things of importance. And he's, uh, he talks about the one item of foreign equipment recently acquired, about which he's quite excited. It's a Soviet prop-driven fighter. He then goes on and talks briefly about Project Paperclip, the program that involved bringing uh, German scientists into the United States to work on programs for us after the war. And in the next paragraph, he says, you might be surprised to learn that as a result of all the flying saucer excitement of last summer, we have a new project called Project Sign to look into this. We have some 300 reports that have not been reported publicly from highly credible witnesses, uh, pilots and scientists and others. And we're taking this very, very seriously. And then, you have no idea how much we wish one of these things would crash somewhere where we could recover it and find out what they are. This is March of 1948. Uh, Roswell took place in July of 1947. This was a classified briefing to the very senior people who advised the chief of staff of the Air Force on just the kind of thing that the Flying Saucer Project was concerning itself with. And you can see this kind of thing repeated over and over and over again in the communications amongst these people in classified documentation, classified top secret, secret, and other levels. I have in my files uh, 40 some odd, I think it's 41 documents in this category in which this kind of discussion takes place. And there's no way in the world that these people would have dissembled in their discussions. I mean, it was you don't lie to each other when you're working together on the same problem trying to solve the case, if you will. And, and on top of that, at that time, there was no Freedom of Information Act. There was no reason on the part of these people to believe that anyone other than their own colleagues would ever see this material, so they wouldn't have been trying to fudge things to just in case, you know, somebody gets their hands on it. So to me, that's kind of the nail, the final nail in the coffin of Roswell. And there's, you know, there's no evidence anywhere in those records that there was any physical evidence in the hands of the U.S. government or any of its allies of the sort that allegedly was recovered at Roswell. And then you also, in one further step, take a look at, 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 you have to take a look at defense policy and programs, U.S. and others, from 1947 to the present. And nowhere there can you find any evidence of any kind of a response to a, to a perceived threat from outer space, except something launched from this planet up through the atmosphere, out into space, and back again, you know. Yet you can see clear, direct responses to other threats, like the Soviet bomber threat, the ICBM threat, all the other kinds of things that have cropped up over the decades. It's, it, it's clearly identifiable, you can see it without question, but there's nothing, nothing to do with the response to a potential flying saucer threat. So, you know, either the people who are in charge of national defense policy all these many years are incredibly malfeasant, were incredibly malfeasant, and the ones that are still alive should be prosecuted, or there wasn't a threat. I, I don't see how we can arrive at any other conclusion. Perhaps you could talk a bit about Gerald Anderson's account of what happened allegedly on the plains of San Augustine and Majestic 12 both of which are rejected by a majority of UFO researchers, and yet Stan Friedman accepts both of them. Is this an example of the will to believe at work? Why is an otherwise rational researcher inclined to accept both of these stories, which to almost everybody else clearly seem to be false? Ufology has problems that go beyond just witnesses that are witnesses quote-unquote. Uh, although that's a continuing problem, there are also problems of alleged real classified or formally classified documents that tend to support the beliefs and dreams, if you will, of people in ufology. In the category of witnesses with quotes, we have Gerald Anderson, who is a fellow who surfaced after the rebroadcast uh, in January of 1990 of the Unsolved Mystery segment about Roswell where the thesis that was advanced in the, the book with the Roswell incident, which Stan Friedman contributed to, although unfortunately didn't get his name on, and that includes a crash of a saucer over on the plains of San Augustine, some 120 or so, 150 or so miles from Roswell, which was, there was speculation that there was a mid-air collision and one saucer crashed near Roswell, the other went down on the plains. 
And the basis or the, the source of the story about the crash on the planes was uh, secondhand from a friend and from family members, friends and family members of a fellow named uh, Barney Barnett, who was a soil conservation service civil engineer who worked out of Socorro, New Mexico, closer to this second site. And it was fairly sketchy, but he claimed, you know, to his friends, he was deceased at the time that the story surfaced, that he had seen this thing crash, that there were bodies and so on. No one to back it up. This was included in the Unsolved Mysteries segment. Uh, they had a picture of Barney Barnett, who interestingly looked a lot like Harry Truman, and in the picture, in fact, was wearing a hat, you know, a Stetson, rather, like what's, what Truman used to wear. After the segment, people began calling in, you know, and as, as for those who don't know, the Unsolved Mysteries uh, format was such that they encouraged people, if you know anything more about this mystery, call us at our 800 number and tell us what you know. Gerald Anderson called in and claimed to have been there when he was a five-year-old kid. And so, of course, obviously, everyone wanted to talk with him, and uh, Kevin Randall and Stan Friedman were the, the first two on the spot. I think Kevin may have interviewed him first, in any event. But he had this very interesting and, and remarkably detailed story to tell about what happened, how he was out there with his family, and they, you know, they... Different versions. Uh, they were there first and found the, th the, the crash saucer and bodies, uh, and then a group of archaeologists from the University of Pennsylvania showed up, and then the Army showed up. Uh, other versions are, you know, uh, the archaeologists were already there when the family got there, and so on. There are all sorts of inconsistencies in his story. He subsequently, because Kevin Randall raised serious questions about his story, he subsequently tried to set about discrediting Randall's questioned uh, it, with such things as uh, falsified telephone records and other matters. He also produced a, uh, a diary that supposedly was written, a handwritten diary supposedly written by his, uh, his uncle Ted, who was one of the people on site, in which the, the case, you know, what happened was, was set forth. It turns out that the ink didn't uh, exist before 1970. Uncle Ted died in 1965 and so on. So there's, there's just, there's his, his cases, or his claims, were just shot full of holes. He also claimed to have been a Navy SEAL uh, and had done other exotic things. Uh, it turns out that he was not a Navy SEAL, and so on. Then, you, then the MJ-12 documents are documents which purportedly were a draft briefing document for President-elect President -elect Eisenhower. Uh, in which the Roswell incident, the Roswell crash and recovery was outlined briefly, and another crash near the border, the Texas, New, or Texas Mexico border, was also outlined, which tended to back up the original scenario of Roswell as presented in the Roswell incident. It's a long and complicated story, but the MJ-12 documents, as well as a, a allegedly supporting memorandum, the Cutler-Twining memorandum, which was found in quotes, found at the National Archives by Jamie Chanderay and Bill Moore. All of these things have one thing in common, that's Bill Moore. They all surfaced in one way or another through Bill Moore, which raises some interesting questions, especially since also through Bill Moore did we get the infamous Shulgin draft intelligence collection memorandum, which supposedly, ma which made references to unidentified flying objects possibly being from another planet which we find out later, turns out this was a retyped, rejiggered, cleverly doctored version of the real thing. Again, from Bill Moore. So all of this is coming from Bill Moore. But those documents and Gerald Anderson seem to provide independent support for a scenario that had already been accepted by a number of people working in the field as being the truth about Roswell. Among them, notably, Stan Friedman. I think, you know, with all due respect to Stan, I think that he, uh, he jumped on the, uh, the Anderson testimony and before that the, uh, the MJ-12 documents because they so neatly packaged up and supported what he had already decided was true about Roswell. One of the things about the, uh, the uh, MJ-12 documents that is very interesting and Stan's interpretation of them and acceptance of them is the inclusion of Dr. Donald Menzel as one of the uh, 12 members of MJ-12. Interesting, you know, it's MJ-12 and there are 12 members. But anyway, Dr. Menzel was the, was the Phil class of his day, if you will. He was the champion debunker of, of uh, UFOs during the 50s and, and 60s. Uh, he was a Harvard astronomer, very highly respected. Absolutely rabid anti-UFO debunker. 
Anyway, he's included as a member of MJ-12, which, of course, many people said, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Why would this debunker be on, you know, be a member of this? Well, Stan started digging, discovered that, that Menzel had this history of working for the National Security Agency as a, a cryptanalyst and so on, and decided, well, this shows that he had this secret life, and that what his debunking was simply, it may have been part of the uh, disinformation campaign of MJ-12, or it was a cover for Menzel's real role, et cetera. But when you look at Menzel's history, it's clear that this is, uh, you know, nothing that he did in the intelligence field had anything to do with UFOs. And uh, his commitment to being anti-UFO was, you know, very personal and very strong. So it was a separate thing. But the, interest, the particularly interesting angle is this. Menzel had a thing for mythical Martians. He doodled them. He made Christmas cards with mythical Martian scenes and funny little Martians running about. He made paintings of Martians. Uh, my friend Jim Mosley, the editor of Saucer Smear, has one signed to him by Menzel of this scene of uh, buxom Martian maidens cavorting about the, uh, the canals of Mars, etc. He was, this was very, very well known amongst his colleagues and everything else. He just had this thing about it. He had also written science fiction for many years under various pseudonyms, too. He put himself through grad school doing that, or at least partly so. Anyhow, in the MJ-12 documents, we had Dr. Menzel cited as being the one person who strongly argues that the saucers are not from the planet Mars. I think that was a kind of inside joke. And I think the joke turned out to be on Stan Friedman. They're saying, ha, 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 you know, not only is, are we, we pulling a fast one on you by putting the arch debunker on this team of people who knew saucers were real, uh, we have him specifically referring uh, to the planet Mars, which was a personal obsession of his. So I would say that uh, this was just a very clever, like I say, inside joke, and also uh, a, a clever way of drawing someone in who was thinking very, in a very convoluted fashion, a lot of what goes on in the intelligence community, where what seems to be so really isn't so, and you know you've got this kind of red herring effect that's going on. So I think that Stan, Stan Friedman bought into the MJ-12 documents and into Gerald Anderson and, frankly, into Glenn Dennis because all of these things tied into what he had already decided was so. And so I think his, and, and I don't, again, I say this with all, all due respect, I mean, I think it's a, it's a perfectly normal human tendency to want to, be, that which you want to believe, Francis Bacon said this, that which you want to believe, you more readily believe to be true. And so anything that comes along that offers proof or supporting evidence to back that up, you're going you're gonna to buy into, if it has the least air of credibility about it. Once you have committed yourself to a particular theory or a particular set of, in this case, uh, like Roswell, uh, witnesses and documents backing up the case and so on, it's extremely difficult, once you've not only committed yourself to them, but you've done so publicly, that you have uh, established a reputation on, on and w that you've written about at length, that you've published books about, etc. It's extremely difficult to stand up and say, whoops, I was wrong. Uh, it's just not in human nature to so readily say, uh, I was wrong. And it's in fact much more likely that what you do then is scramble around and, and, and I, I don't mean to, to be disparaging about this, because when I say, not scramble around, but what you do is you say, okay, people are raising criticisms. In the ideal world, what you do then is you step back and you say very objectively, well, let's take a look at those criticisms, and let's take a look at what it is that I have been touting and that, that I have been uh, accepting, and see how they stack up against each other, and if there are problems, then, you know, we'll identify them and we'll say that's life. What usually happens instead, though, is, is that you rush around trying to find out ways to, to stop up the holes in the dike and, and to refute the uh, arguments made by your detractors. Uh, rather than offering up you know, more objective evidence, more additional information that, 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 says, that shows that these people are wrong and you're right, in, in an objective accumulation of information, you instead begin to engage in the kind of thing that goes on in ufology all the time. It's, you know, you, you keep pounding away on your particular arguments and, and do your best to ignore or, or vigorously disparage the character of your detractors. And I just think that's just, it's, a, it's an unfortunate function of human nature. And in ufology, you don't have the same kind of 
referee journals and peer review process that you have in other disciplines where that kind of thing can be sorted out more effectively. Ufology has, uh, as a field, has, has or more correctly, the focus of ufology as a field has evolved significantly and dramatically over the decades since it really was born back in the, in the late 1940s. The original concerns and focuses for, for a long time, in fact, after the beginnings of all of this, were, were the phenomena itself. What is it? What are these things that we're seeing? Where do they come from? What does it mean? What, what can we find by looking at the uh, operational characteristics of these objects and their shapes and, and the things that are reported about how they fly and all this sort of thing? What can we discern from this? Let's address the idea of they can't get here from there, the notion that if these beings are from outside our solar system, how can they possibly get here given what we know about the current state of physics and so on. These are the kinds of focuses that went on. I mean, there, were, there was a sort of undercurrent and always an undercurrent of, of a bit of paranoia about, well, the government knows more than it's telling us, and so there is something of a cover-up in that regard. But that was a bit of a sideshow. There was also a, the sideshow of the contactees, the people who claimed to have received wisdom from the Space Brothers about one thing or another, usually having to do in the 50s with uh, our blowing ourselves up with nuclear weapons and then later the environment and other kinds of problems. But those were, again, sideshows. Those were the fringes. The focus was on a scientific and, and historical and, and psychological research focused on the UFO phenomenon and the people who were reporting it and all of that sort of thing. Stan Friedman was, uh, was very much a major contributor to some really very, very important and, and, and contributed very, very important work to that kind of, of what you would think of as scientific ufology. Let's look at the phenomenon. What does the data tell us? What can we learn from this about our visitors, if there are visitors, uh, and where they come from? What, for example, Stan did a lot of really fine work on uh, the analysis of the, uh, the Betty Hill star map, the map that Betty Hill sketched based on what she said she had been shown while she was uh, being held by alien beings in New Hampshire. He made all these very wonderful contributions, and that was, you could see it almost personified in the work he was doing, you could see ufology. As, as time went by, as Roswell came to the fore, as the abductions came to the fore, we found ourselves more and more focused on government cover-up and conspiracy and less on what the government was covering up and conspiring about. That is, the UFO phenomenon and the data about it. We found ourselves focusing more and more on personal stories that were unverifiable about alleged abduction. And, but largely, the focus was this issue of cover-up at the expense of what I think of as real UFO research. And Stan moved into that, that realm with a vengeance, with Roswell. And he spent the past, you know, 20 years now really focused on things like MJ-12 and government conspiracy and all of that, and has done very little, sadly, on the kind of things that he was working on in the past. I don't know how much of this is a consequence of frustration after years and years and years of trying to tease out the answers from the data in hand and how much of it is a genuine belief that if we crack this cover-up we're going to have all the answers so let's not waste any more time poking around with the data and, and doing all that rather boring hard work. That I don't know. I, it's, I suppose in some ways it's, it's also more exciting if you're thinking in terms of cover-up. You know, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of, um, you know, James Bondish, ish X-File-ish kind of aspect to it that makes it more fun. I mean, sitting down and crunching numbers and processing data and uh, about, you know, how many formation flights were seen of, of uh, daylight disks between 1947 and 1957 and how many right angle turns were reported and what, are, you know, what does the radar data tell us and so forth is, that's boring. It also requires work and a lot of, hard work. Uh, it's much easier and much more exciting to stand up and, and tell exciting tales of government cover-up and conspiracy. A and actually, if you're, if you're thinking in terms of government cover-up and conspiracy and intimidation of witnesses and all of that, that tends to validate your own importance, too, because they care about what we're doing. If you don't have that kind of attention from them, then who are you but just another bunch of uh, folks that are interested in something that's slightly off the wall.
What do you make of Dr. Stephen Greer and his disclosure project, or the very idea of disclosure of some top secret information by the United States government or any other government in general? Uh, in recent years, ufology has taken a kind of political turn for the worse in my, in my way of thinking. In part, some of this was taking place back when Roswell was very hot. And you had groups like uh, Operation Right to Know and others who were holding demonstrations in front of the White House and demanding uh, you know, that the government release the truth about flying saucers now. And all of that, kind of uh, you know, a, a ufological version of the 60s, if you will. And now we have the Disclosure Project, as it's called, uh, headed by Dr. Stephen Greer, uh, MD, which has combined what I think of as kind of a, an updated, you know, in the trappings of 2001 version of contacteeism, because Greer and others claim that they have, rec they have learned from the aliens with whom they've been in touch that there are certain things going on on this earth about which they're very concerned. Uh, nuclear weapons, ballistic missile defense, deployment of weapons in space, the environment, the keeping of the truth from the people about free energy, which this supposedly was uh, learned about through uh, the recovery of uh, Roswell UFO technology and other kinds of things like that and so on. And they've combined that with more conventional political agendas that are compatible. That is, the people, for instance, who are, uh, who are opposed to uh, the current administration's, the Bush administration's ballistic missile defense program have latched onto this. And uh, people that are concerned about environmental questions have latched onto this. So there's this kind of marriage of uh, what used to be fringe ufology with political agendas, non-ufological political agendas. And I'm concerned that this is dragging the field further, still further away from the real consideration of the phenomenon. We're off into all sorts of peripheral realms which have nothing whatever to do with getting to the answers about the UFO mystery. I think one of the problems that we have in ufology today and have always really had, for that matter, and it's true, I think, of, uh, of other fields as well, and that is that um, there is a sort of celebrity factor at work and there is a kind of an excitement factor at work so that whoever it is that's come along most recently with the most exciting and titillating new set of ideas or, or, or claims is the celebrity of the hour. And, you know, so the, the, the wilder and more uh, exotic your claim, the more attention you're going to get. And so the, those of us like uh, myself and, and uh, Kevin Randall and Stan Friedman and, and Dick Hall and uh, the other few folks in the field who I think of as, as genuinely serious ufological researchers are, you know, seen as, as really rather mundane and plodding and, uh, and not particularly interesting. And the trouble with, with ufology, coupled with that, is that it is not, again, it is not a, an established discipline with all of the usual trappings of established disciplines with university chairs and, and, and uh, research grants and all the other stuff that goes with it. The people who want to keep working in this in any serious way have to make a living in one fashion or another. And if they can do it in connection with their UFO research, so much the better. So what you find yourself having to do is write things, say things, present things that people find interesting and will pay money for. And so you're, you know, uh, you're in competition with each other just like uh, any other you know, uh, uh, rock bands, movie stars, whatever else it might be. And if somebody comes along who has gotten a better show, even if what's behind that show is not worth a hoot, they're going to be sucking up the, uh, the, the minimal resources that are available and uh, the, you know, the, the folks who are trying to continue to do good work are really basically left out in the cold. I'm not saying it's gotten that far yet, but it's getting there. It's moving in that direction. Let me just add one further thought to this, and that is that we have contributed that to that ourselves because we have promoted, if you will, more and more exotic ideas. We have focused on things which draws, have drawn us away from looking at the phenomenon. We focused on Roswell, we focused on government cover-up, we focused up on, uh, on, on issues of uh, illegal intimidation of witnesses and all sorts of things like that. And we should have been 
trying to steer a much more conservative course, at least in my opinion. In, in no small degree, the problem uh, of the focus on cover-up and government conspiracy in, in ufology is a product, I think, not of a real cover-up of UFO information or government knowledge about UFOs, but rather real cover-ups like took place in Roswell of things having nothing to do with UFOs and just plain bureaucratic stupidity and inertia. The late James McDonald, atmospheric physicist at the University of Arizona, who was one of the most uh, effective proponents of the idea that science should take UFOs very seriously, used to say the question was a question of cover-up or screw-up. And uh, he concluded it was mostly screw-up. And I believe that to be the case, too. And Roswell's a good example of that. As the demand from the public grew for answers, all the Air Force did was, you know, push the button that says, you know, generate message to UFO idiots that says, you know, we finished our studies back in 1969. There was no threat to national security. There was no uh, perception that we could advance science by doing any further studies. All of our records have gone to the National Archives. You can go over there and find the information. And they send it out. They kept doing this. Yeah, people were getting more and more frustrated, and, uh, and so they began approaching their elected representatives, particularly in New Mexico, uh, where, where Roswell is and where the incident took place. And they were contacting Congressman Joe Skeen, who represents the Roswell area, as well as Congressman Steve Schiff, the late Congressman Steve Schiff, who uh, represented um, central New Mexico, Albuquerque, and so forth, adjacent to, to Joe's district, about this case and saying, please help us, can you get some information? Well, Congressman Skeen and Congressman Schiff talked about this. Uh, a member of uh, Skeen's staff approached the member of Schiff's staff, who approached my wife, who was his boss on Schiff's staff, <laughs> and I got involved and thought, well, this is something we might be, be well be worth pursuing. And I and Fred Whiting of the Fund for UFO Research, both having worked on the Hill and knowing how this game was played, thought we would, we might be able to help facilitate the process. Ultimately, uh, Congressman Schiff decided to run with it, and, and he'd take it, as a, take it on as a constituent inquiry, as it were. He didn't realize, I think, what he was getting into, to be honest. But the letter he sent went to the then new Secretary of Defense, Les Aspen, and he, he said, I want, you know, I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to have a, a, a written report on, you know, what really happened here, and I would like to have someone come over and brief me about it. Well, he was ignored. And this, there were several rounds of this, and he finally got uh, a, a letter from a, 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 a Colonel Larry Shockley, who served in the Legislative Affairs Office of the Office of the Secretary of Defense, directing or suggesting that he go to the National Archives to get the information, uh, and forwarding his letter to the archives. Well, the archives sent then a letter to sent a letter back to the congressman saying we've received this from the Air Force, and in effect said you know the Air Force doesn't know its elbow from its wherever uh, because they would if they were being responsive to you they would know we didn't have anything like that over here so the congressman was getting more and more exercised about being blown off especially since as it happens he was a reserve colonel in the united states air force and you know that's kind of dumb politically for a lot of reasons so while trying to decide what to do next the head of the gao came over prior to hearings on his agency's budget. That's the, this is the uh, General Accounting Office, which is the investigative and auditing arm that, of, the, of the Congress's uh, bureaucracy. And uh, he was making the rounds of members of the Oversight Committee to basically say, hi, I'm going to be over here next week. Is there anything I ought to be talking about that you'd be interested in, and so on. And at the end of the interview with Congressman Schiff, the congressman, uh, he said to the congressman, uh, Charles Bauscher, the head of GAO, said to the congressman, is there anything we can do for you? Is there anything that particular we can do for you? And the congressman said, well, as a matter of fact. And he told him what was going on with Roswell and asked if they could do anything. And Bauscher said, well, this is kind of unusual, but yeah, I think we can do something. Well, I, I can imagine what his staff must have thought when he got back to his office and said the congressman wants us to look into this flying saucer crash. I mean, they, I, you know, I, having been there on, in the, you know, in situations like that, I'm sure they just had a fit. But they stepped up to it, and they agreed to look into it, to do an audit, and began this uh, this process. Well, 
when the GAO begins a process like this, they inform the agencies that they are going, whose uh, program or whatever else it is they're going to be looking into, and they they ask that the they for the cooperation of the agency, which they're required to give by law and so on. The Air Force proceeded to do what it was supposed to do, and then some. I think this was the wake-up call. They decided, by golly, we better dig into this thing and see if we can come up with some answers or at least something that will satisfy the congressman. So they began not only to be cooperative and uh, with the GAO, or at least to the extent that they thought they could get away with, they also launched their own investigation. And in 1994, in July of 1994, they released their report, or they released the executive summary of their report with all the backup stuff available for a long time only at the Pentagon Library. You could get in there, but the trick was going through all the various hoops to get in. And essentially what they said was that, yes, something real happened at Roswell. There was a, a cover-up because it was a classified program. It was the uh, program named Project Mogul. Its purpose was to develop the means to detect Soviet nuclear weapons tests. And the reason there was a cover-up is that uh, they didn't want the Soviets to know what they were doing. Thank you very much. You know, there's your answer. They didn't say a word about the bodies question. They only re dealt with the physical material, the, the, the debris and the like, that was recovered and brought in. So uh, more clamoring went on. Meanwhile, the GAO report was uh, delivered to Congressman Schiff and made public by him. And they essentially... Uh, said we could find nothing in any of our audit efforts that uh, would provide any further useful information about this case. Uh, the Air Force has uh, issued their report. Um, it would appear that this is probably, you know, the answer. And we've done our job. Thank you. Based on what I have learned from various sources, the GAO was getting more and more nervous about its role in this, not because they felt they were involved in some dicey area of cover-up, but because they were suffering more and more from concerns about ridicule and, uh, you know, oh, your guys are the ones that are chasing flying saucers, ha, 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 you know. And they, they had a, a problem with it in terms of their institutional credibility, I think. And so they told their, you know, they told their principal investigators essentially, okay, you know, you've spent your budget, time to write your report. So they stopped short of where the two guys, the two field investigators, uh, probably would have liked to have gone, but you know, they did what they had to do. So the GAO report was an interesting breakthrough in terms of uh, ufology because we, what we got was con a congressman who pressed it hard enough to get this kind of action. Uh, the GAO responded. Moreover, what it did was light a fire under the Air Force to finally actually try to substantively address the questions that had been asked for so long. But they only went, far, only went so far, as I said. They did not address the bodies issue. Captain James McAndrew, who is a, uh, an Air Force Reserve officer who was part of a declassification team, uh, and that's how he got into the investigation, was the principal grunt worker, if you will, on the original report, and he felt that they hadn't gone far enough either, that they needed to do the body issue uh, and address that question, and so he persuaded his superiors to let him do the work. And so, the, as uh, Stan Friedman calls it, the final, final report was released in 1997, ironically, on the anniversary of uh, the 50th anniversary of Kenneth Arnold's famous uh, sighting that started the whole modern flying saucer era, June 24th, 1997, with a, an absurd press conference in which they had a colonel stand up and make the presentation, a gentleman who'd never worked on the investigation in the first place, who had been briefed up the night before on what was going on and who was sort of thrown into the breach. left the, and, and so he stood up there trying to, I think, honestly answer questions, but coming across as somebody who was trying to cover things up. And they had a very difficult job to do because what McAndrew had dug out was evidence that people who claim to have seen alien bodies, Gerald Anderson being one of those most notable in all of this, and claimed to have been intimidated by military people and claimed to have seen very elaborate recovery operations that included the landing of a C-47 twin-engine transport on a highway near the site of the uh, incident and so on. They, apparently there was a basis in actual fact for what they were claiming. McAndrew dug into everything that he could find that he thought might explain the stories of alien bodies. 
And what he discovered was these remarkable parallels between operations conducted by uh, uh, the Air Force in New Mexico in the early to middle 50s and a little bit beyond that involved the use of anthropomorphic dummies and the kind of recovery operations described by Gerald Anderson and others and uh, the kinds of personnel teams involved, the airplanes, the, uh, the, the ambulances, the types of trucks, it all fit. It's a very complex case to make and the way the Air Force went about you know, embarrassedly, if you will, uh, trying to divest themselves of this whole thing, just made it, it was made it ready-made as a joke. And in fact, I was interviewed by uh, NBC News uh, when the report was released, and all I had seen was summary information about the report, and I thought it was silly, and said so. Well, subsequently, I read the report, and well, McAndrew tried to push a lot of his data well beyond, you know, what it would really explain, the core material is right on target as far as I'm concerned. And I, you know, I go into this in my book in some length. The Glenn Dennis stories about the bodies at the base hospital where they were terribly mutilated and they were black and they, they, were, they were, seemed to be shredded and horrible stench emanating from them and all of that. Well, this, you can tie this directly and I think accurately to the crash on takeoff of a KC-97 tanker which was a you know flying gas tank, if you will, uh, in 1956. It took off from what was then Walker Air Force Base, the old Roswell like, Army Air Base, and uh, it had, it, it, uh, one of the props threw a blade. The thing blew up. You had 11 crewmen uh, who were incinerated in this horrible crash. The bodies, three of them, were brought right directly to the base hospital, and where they were, they were examined there briefly. The smell was so bad they put them into cold storage. They eventually went to the Ballard Funeral Home where Glenn Dennis worked at the time and the, the actual autopsy was performed by a, um, a local physician who was, I guess, the acting coroner. I'm not sure about that part of it, but at any event, all of this stuff fit very nicely into Glenn's story. And on top of that, they brought in a, the Air Force as identification specialists who come in to identify bodies that are otherwise not readily identifiable. And the guy, ought, usually these specialists work in standard uh, physicians, operating room garb and masks and all of that sort of stuff, and the guy who was involved, the principal who was involved in, the, in this KC-97 crash said when interviewed that he was frequently mistaken for a pathologist, which of course is what Glenn said the two men were who were working there at the hospital on the alien bodies. The conditions of the, body, the bodies as he described them match very nicely to, on, to the ops, autopsy reports including the size, because in what they had in certain instances, they had only about, you know, 60% uh, of the body from just below the abdomen down to about halfway down to the knees, that kind of thing. So it, it all fit. But again, it's a complex case to make, and the Air Force was constrained by a lot of considerations, uh, you know, legal and otherwise, not to say it quite like I think McAndrew wanted to say it, which was that this wasn't a matter of just mistaken recollection and mixing of, of, of uh, experience, but rather was actually in some cases probably uh, consciously borrowed from real experience to give the flavor of reality to what they were saying. I think Gerald Anderson's a perfect example of that. I think he probably read about, heard about, saw things to do with these operations uh, with the anthropomorphic dummies and the like, and then just looped that into his story uh, because uh, obviously the best way to tell a tall tale is to give it uh, as large an element of reality and truth as you possibly can. So I think it was a combination of, uh, of innocent confabulation and, and, um, and, and co-mingling of, of disparate ideas over time and uh, in some cases and, and in other cases uh, somewhat more uh, creative exploitation of that. I think that um, the, the bodies question is a lot more difficult to deal with because of the nature of the evidence that shows what these people might have been using, either innocently or otherwise. And unfortunately, it, it's not something that's amenable to a, re, uh, a reporter paying a lot of time, to spending the time he needs to understand it and then write a story to meet his deadline. Uh, it's not amenable to just very convenient soundbite discussion and so on. So it, it was much easier to make jokes about anthropomorphic dummies and crash test dummies and all that sort of stuff and not pay closer attention to the substance of what they'd actually turned up. This is clearly the kind of thing that, that is open to interpretation. 
it's not there's not a you don't have a clear cut connection between what Gerald Anderson and Glenn Dennis and others have said and those events. There's no place is there a letter from Glenn Dennis to someone else saying, boy, did I fool those people. I, you know, heck, I remember all this stuff from this KC-97 crash, and that worked in there beautifully. So it's open to interpretation. And, and if you have committed yourself strongly to, in this case, the, the explanation of Roswell as being the crash and recovery of a flying saucer in the bodies of its crew, then you are going to be inclined to discount evidence to the contrary. Your, your, your natural tendency is going to be to discount evidence that, to the contrary. Uh, by the same token, if you're a skeptic, uh, you're going to jump onto this, or you, you might. They, interestingly enough, most skeptics have been a little bit leery of the anthropomorphic dummy explanation. If, as I like to think of myself, uh, you are trying to get to the bottom of the mystery and you're trying to, st and you're, you're doing your best to stand back from making a commitment to any particular point of view until you've really looked at the evidence as objectively as you can. When you see the evidence pile up like it has in the case of the anthropomorphic dummies, the KC-97, the red-headed officer that worked at the base, uh, the other red-headed officer that was there because of an accident, and other things that play into the story, not just incidentally, not just a little bit here, a little bit there, but a big pile of evidence, circumstantial evidence, it suggests to you that that makes good sense. It suggests that that really is the basis for these stories, or at least it helped make the stories more interesting. Given all that you've just said about Roswell and ufology in general, why do you still believe that some UFO cases represent proof of extraterrestrial visitation to Earth? The vast body of data which has been accumulated over the past 50 years and more concerning UFOs and the UFO, UFO phenomenon contains within it a smaller but still very substantial body of data that makes very clear to me objectively that we're dealing with a phenomenon or more correctly a set of phenomena which are anomalous, which are not readily explainable or explainable at all in terms of known phenomena, natural or otherwise. And within that, there's a body of data that, is, uh, that involves reports, credible reports, thoroughly investigated reports, which can only point directly to the observation of vehicles designed and operated by non-human intelligence or alternatively a hoax. Unfortunately, we don't have any one case yet where we have absolute proof positive that there can be no doubt that what people said they saw or photographed or whatever it might be is indeed an alien spacecraft or alien beings or both. We don't have one that's solid, you know, that, that, that doesn't still have one, the, the, at least an infinitesimally small part of it that suggests that the possibility it could have been a hoax. But there are, there's, there are enough really good, solid cases out there that point to us having been visited by alien beings, by beings from another world, that I'm firmly convinced that we have been, and that, that, that it's worth continuing the quest to dig through that data and find that proof if it's there. You know, it may be, it may be that in all of this, we don't have the kind of proof that we would like to have because when you're dealing with, if, if we are in fact being visited or have been visited by non-human intelligence, you're not dealing with a natural phenomenon that's a repeatable thing where you can catch it several times and try to sort out the answers. This is especially true if they've been here and they left, which I kind of think they is the case. I think they probably got here. This is a, you know, a semi-serious working hypothesis. I think they got here sometime in the middle 50s and they left sometime in the late 60s or early 70s after having spent a lot of time studying us very closely and looking over the solar system very closely and you know the grad students occasionally getting drunk and buzzing the natives and uh, and uh, you know some uh, scientists getting a little bit out of hand and ignoring the prime directive and and uh, grabbing Betty and Barney Hill and I think that they really were this is one case where I think that we have a real abduction and when they finished their work they left and, uh, you know, they, they may have been sufficiently careful that they didn't leave the kind of proof behind that we would need to deal with it. 
and actually come up with an answer. So it's kind of like the early uh, European explorations along the Atlantic coast of North America. An Indian may, be, may have been standing on the beach and he saw Sir Francis Drake and his ships off shore and got all excited and said, my God, what am I looking at? This is, and he go, runs back and tells his tribe. They come back and look, the ships are gone. There's no proof. They were there. They were seen, but there's no proof that they were there. And I think we're kind of in the same boat with, uh, with UFOs. They were there, all right. People really did see them, but, and I hope I'm wrong about this, they didn't leave enough behind for us to be able to say, by golly, not only, you know, were they here, but this is what we're dealing with. This is where they, you know, that they obviously aren't something from this planet. So I think, you know, I think with, with UFOs, we've got a combination of things. I think we've got a body of some very interesting natural phenomenon that are yet unknown, and, and the data contains the stuff that should give the basis for some good scientific exploration. And I think that we've also got visitors from another world, here and gone, but maybe coming back.